So uh, welcome to our COIL conversation this afternoon. Uh, my name is Larry Reagan. I'm one of the directors of the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to, I think, hey, let me just check our last COIL conversation of the year. So we're going out with a bang. <laughs> We've got a good one here today. So terrific. And first off, let me welcome our guest online. Uh, I suspect we'll have others coming in through the afternoon, but uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And just by way of protocol, uh, uh, Brad Stenick, who does a terrific job moderating our online part, will be your, he'll be your uh, channeler today. So as you have questions, conversations uh, online, and you want things to uh, come forward to uh, Marcella and our guest, please uh, work with uh, Brad to do that. He signifies, yes, signifies, he notifies me. Well, he also signifies me, but he notifies me that he's got a question, and then we'll get that question uh, answered. Uh, in the room, if you have a question or comment as we're going through the afternoon, just put your hand up. I will ask that, we'll, that you wait until we get a mic to you. That way our guests online can also hear you at the same time. Okay, does that sound fair? All right, terrific. Well, let me just tell you, it is a pleasure this afternoon. First of all, it's a pleasure to see Marcella again. We were teasing that we, we haven't uh, connected for a while, but Marcella is one of my favorite faculty members and researchers. That's quite a compliment. Well, she does great stuff. She's uh, very engaging. And um, let me tell you, once she gets started on her topic domain, she's, she's a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to, as a matter of fact, uh, I glanced over today and, and saw that she has about 300 slides in her deck. And don't worry, it we're not going through It made me a little nervous. So, <laughs> so, but she says, no, don't, don't worry about that. So Marcella is an assistant professor of education in the learning design and technology department of the College of Education. Uh, she has been a researcher for a number of years here at Penn State as a postdoc first in the College of IST and then in College of Education. And um, I connected with Marcella a number of years ago around a similar project uh, that I think has kind of continued to morph into what she's sharing today. And, and her interest has always been in collaboration, uh, teamwork, group thinking, and how that informs and impacts us as learners, and it's really fascinating work. Marcella is going to be joined today by T.K. Lee. So, T.K., this is your official uh, blurb, I have to tell you. You're a research and developed engineer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay, that's the correct term. Uh, and I know that uh, T.K. has been working with Marcella on the project, and we're, uh, T.K. is with the Education Technology Services Unit here at Penn State, and we also have online with us, uh, I'll call him backup, uh, technical backup, uh, Marcella tells me he's a longtime friend and collaborator of uh, Dr. Borge, and his name is Todd uh, Shimoda. Shimoda. I did okay. Uh, he's developed a variety of different educational systems with Marcella and uh, with the Thinker Tools Research Group. So he's also a, uh, a budding author, she says. So we're going to have a uh, great, and it's great to see a, a group forming here in the room. More folks are coming in. So, so without further ado, I've asked Marcella to spend um, uh, 25, 30 minutes walking us through her model. And as she's doing that, I would ask that you think about your questions that you might want to pose. Again, just a reminder, put your hand up first. We'll get a mic to you. And uh, again, Brad will help channel questions from our online group. So... I'm sure we'll have an engaging session. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Marcella. Thank All you. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, so today uh, I want to talk about a system that Todd and I have been working on for a while to try to improve the ways in which people have conversations with each other to create new knowledge. Um, and I'm here today with TK um, because I was fortunate enough to be picked as a fellow by TLT and they are working with us to expand this prototype into something that will be available to any faculty at the university. So because of that, the way that I wanted to frame today's talk, it's not going to be so much about research and I don't plan on going too deep on the theory, though I'm happy to go there if anybody wants to. Um, the main thing that I want to cover is sort of uh, what the design problem was, um, some of the ways that we've thought about trying to improve that through the use of technology, and some ways which we've used that for teaching. But all of these things that you see here are available for conversation, <laughs> hence the billions of slides. Um, and if anybody has a question or wants me to talk about that, I'd be happy to do so. Because there's some interesting design decisions that we had to make, and there's also a lot of evaluation that we've been done that we've been doing on the utility of the system. 
One thing I definitely want to try and address, because I know there's a wide range of people who are here listening, is some very interesting possibilities for research that are available for the system because of its modifiability. So with that, um, let's get started. Before I start talking about the in-depth part of the system, it's really important that I define what I mean by collaboration because this is a term that is used very loosely, often uh, as another word for cooperation. But when people who study collaborative learning or computer-supported collaborative learning talk about this word, they mean something very, very specific. What they mean is a form of interaction where individuals in a group will externalize their ideas for the goal of synthesizing them all into a shared understanding. For the purpose of trying to collectively negotiate what is known so that they can create new knowledge that didn't exist anywhere in the group, not in any one person or in any artifact or piece of information that was brought to the group. So that's what we're specifically talking about. And that definition is one that I've sort of, um, you know, modified over the years, but builds on a lot of work that you see here on this slide, particularly uh, Rochelle Teasley and Jerry Stahl, who does some really excellent work on this as well. Okay, so let's talk about why collaborative competence matters. Now, I knew I was giving this talk, so I wanted a really cool quote, right? And so I googled uh, you know, quotes for collaboration on the internet. And I was like, oh, Charles Darwin, this is, this is a lovely quote, and it really supports my narrative. Uh, the problem is there's really no evidence that Charles Darwin ever actually said this. <laughs> I heard he posted it on the internet. It may have been, right? So it, there's at least 10 websites who say this is a Charles Darwin quote, but I found, because when I go through Google, I'll go through like at least 10 pages. <laughs> that there's, oh, there's no evidence that he actually ever said this, and so there's some controversy about this. And this is the really interesting thing about where we are right now. Because um, human beings are really interesting creatures. Uh, we like to create tools. We like to create really fancy, cool tools that we think are going to help us somehow. Um, but what we're really bad at is long-term thinking. Um, and so what happens is that we create things and we don't fully understand what the unintended consequences of that are. And I think we're starting to experience some unintended consequences right now with regards to a lot of the technologies that we have developed. And one of the things that is troublesome is that it, in my lifetime, we have gone from a culture and a society where information was really difficult to get to one where we cannot avoid information. Um, and this has some really important implications for education because our educational system was designed to really resolve some of the problems from that first situation, right? Um, making sure that people read information, memorize information, can recall information, and share the appropriate information. But as a whole, we're not really great about teaching people how to analyze share, synthesize, and negotiate information. And that's really what I'm interested in and why I think this is important. Now, um, when I was a graduate student, I actually was going to be a high school teacher. And so I spent a lot of time going to different schools. And one of the things that I saw that was really troublesome was the lack of opportunity for students to engage in collaborative activities and how these lacks of opportunity were often dependent upon the socioeconomic status of that school. And so schools that had a lot more money and resources, they had project-based learning and they had a lot of really cool ways for students to do things together. But, stu but those schools with less resources, this was less so. So I saw this as a really big problem. Um, the lack of um, really optimal interactions during collective decision making and thinking is not just a problem that we see in education. You see it across many different contexts 
I.O. Psychology has a lot of really great work on this. Um, if you look at business and innovation, it's one of the things that stands in the way of business, business and innovation. Um, and if you look at uh, human factors research and crisis management, uh, Kozlowski and Ilgen have a beautiful paper about the importance of this as well. So there's a lot of really important implications for why we should care about this. And before all of these things were hidden, um, because all these problems that happened in group context and all the problems that we had with collective decision making and sense making, no one really could see it out in the open. But technology these days has really brought this to the forefront. We are seeing sort of big problems that come from a really lack of ability to communicate for the purpose of building shared understanding and knowledge. And so one of the things that I think is important for us to start thinking about is, you know, A, are we preparing our students for these types of really important functions out in the world? Or are the types of teaching opportunities that we're giving them such that they sort of develop their understanding in isolation as individuals with no set practice or skills of how to now negotiate what they have learned with someone else. So this is a challenge that Todd and I took on. Uh, we started off by thinking, well, how could we use technology to support the development of collaborative competence, right? That's, that was our main sort of design question. And it's not an easy question by any sense. Because now here is my challenge as a speaker today to you, the audience, is I have to convince you of a couple of things. And one of them is that cognition is nested. Now, for those of us that study cognition, we're like, yeah, of course it is. But for a lot of people, this is a very controversial claim. Because most people think that cognition exists in the head of individuals. We make sense of things, and we interact with things. But always, this is where cognition lives. Well, those of us who are more influenced by sort of social cultural theories of learning, we argue, no, 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 no. Cognition exists in culture, in the community. Every time you think of something, you create a tool, you create an artifact, that's going to influence the rules and value systems of that culture and community. And that's going to affect how groups interpret things that happen and what counts as knowledge and what is valuable. And that's going to affect the individual. And it's really important when you understand that this type of thinking is nested because it also has implications for how we use technology. And it also has implications for how we think about these problems. But the good news is that, um, you know, uh, unlike uh, the gentleman who wrote A Political Mind, uh, Lakoff, I think, Lakoff, um, he is concerned because he sees that when we engage sort of in discourse, a lot of people are far more influenced by emotion and a lot of the things that you see sort of happening that people are more likely to change behavior if you use propaganda. Um, I don't think that that is always going to be the case because higher order thinking skills can be taught. And there's a lot of research that shows this, but it takes practice, right? But in order to be able to know how to develop it and how to use technology, we really have to understand this really complicated process of how groups sort of go through the process of sharing. Now, I did some research a um, few years ago for the Office of Naval Research, and they really wanted to understand how cognition happens sort of collectively. So I did sort of a cognitive analysis of 20 teams at a microanalysis level. And I won't get into how long that took. But the point is, that what we saw was that during this process, right, the individuals are interpreting whatever information they have. And from those interpretations, they share certain information and not. And that right there is just sort of what happens at the individual level. And a lot of things can go wrong. But at the group level, then comes the synthesis and the negotiation. And it's not like individuals aren't doing this. Individuals are doing that process, too. It's just happening sort of at the same time as the group. And what this means is that there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right? At an individual level, individuals are actively constructing knowledge while they're part of the group. They're remembering things. They're figuring out what to share. And if they don't understand the information, that's a problem. But sometimes there's problems of comprehension that happen between people. And look at all the things that can go wrong at the level of the group. Now. 
a lot of really great research has focused just on this part right here, right? And I'm talking about self-regulated learning, metacognition. What we've found is that when individuals regulate their individual knowledge construction processes, it actually makes learning more efficient and better and deeper and richer. And it can help to mitigate a lot of comprehension problems. So we know that that is, is, is definitely true, right? Just think about your ability to regulate your attention when you're reading a chapter book. And sometimes you start thinking about the dinner that you have to cook and everything. But you catch yourself and then you go back and you focus. These things also happen at the level of the group, but they look different. It's like when people go off task and they talk about things that are not related to the goal at hand. When two people think they're talking about the same thing, but they're actually thinking about different things. And so what's happening now is that more and more people who study how people think collectively are realizing that there's a certain type of social uh, metacognition that has to happen, right? There has to be type of uh, ability to understand what these types of thinking processes are and how to monitor and regulate them so that we can think in ways which are more conducive to shared knowledge construction. And uh, there has been some great work that, you know, Barron did back in 2003. Uh, Yarvella and Hadwin are doing some work. And of course, this is work that um, I started way back in 2002, uh, before it was cool to do. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that a lot more people are looking into this because it really is a very important problem. And the more that we start thinking about it, the more that we realize that the design challenge is not how do we use technology to help people collaborate better or develop collaborative competence, but the design challenge is really, for us, how do we use technology to support the development of socio-metacognitive expertise? If we want people to be able to adapt to different types of individuals and different types of artifacts, then they have to be able to know how to monitor and how to regulate different types of collective thinking processes. And so this is sort of uh, what led Todd and I to develop the CREATE system. Now, before I show the video, I, I want to let you know why I'm doing a video and not just showing you live. There's students that are actually using the video, I mean the, the tool right now. So I don't want you to see their names because I have to protect their privacy. But in the video I was able to sort of cut off their names so I can show you some of the things that the system can do. So um, this is the CREATE system. We wondered whether we could use technology as a means to provide richer social learning opportunities and at the same time help students to develop their ability to have high quality collaborative discussions by making the process, the product, to be assessed. And this is really what led to CREATE. In the CREATE system, an administrator can take a look at all the team's processes and see how they're doing and what they think their strengths and weaknesses are. But teams can actually go in and have meetings inside, discussions around course content. Afterwards, we actually give them criteria from our understanding of group processes and really articulate theory in a way that students can use to examine their own processes and really focus in on the process as the thing to be assessed. Over time, they can keep track of their strengths and weaknesses and collectively come up with strategies to help them improve. So it looks like the audio and the video weren't exactly synced, but um, this right here is sort of the monitor page where they can take a look over time and then the system actually provides them with strategies um, based upon what they think their biggest weakness is. All right. So, oh, it looks like, let me go back. It's nice I can do this. All right. So, possibilities uh, for teaching. I want to talk a little bit about how we've used this and wh what this means for teachers in terms of incorporating it into a course because this is really important. Um, so, there's two ways that uh, I've used this thus far. The first is with undergraduate courses, and in specific undergraduate 
online courses, right, where students don't get the opportunity to really have the group experience. Um, I let them sort of get to know each other and um, let the course stable out a little bit because online courses, people sort of drop um, and, and join. It, it varies a bit in the beginning. By week four, I replace every other week, uh, whether it's like an essay or multiple choice, which is the way that I took over this course and helped to restructure it, it used to be multiple choice questions, with these discussion sessions in Create. And what the students do is that they have to read like a textbook or whatever the assigned course content is. And then with that, each individual has to answer, say, three really deep dive questions for that content. Then they decide with their team when they meet. They meet with their team. And they have to sort of discuss those questions collectively. And they do this you know, through many different times in the, in the curriculum. After they have the discussion, then they go through in the CREATE system and actually read through their discussion to look for evidence of the types of interactions that experts in collaborative learning have sort of tied with better decision making and better collective thinking processes. Now I've also used this in graduate courses. And the really interesting thing about this, uh, this conversation today is there's actually students here who have taken my graduate course and used the system. So they can speak to the good and the bad <laughs> of the system if you're interested. The way that I do with the graduate students, though, it's even more um, sort of centered around the goal of the course. My course is separated into three themes. So let's say computer-supported collaborative learning. The first part is sort of the theoretical foundations for the field. The second part is sort of design implications. And then the third part might be emerging sort of uh, technologies or emerging themes in the field. At the end of each section, um, this is a resident course, we don't meet. They meet online in CREATE. And the goal there is for them to synthesize all of the readings for that part in the course and discuss them. Um, and to also connect it to other readings outside of the course and other things that are going on sort of culturally. Um, and it really gives them opportunity to apply and think about these concepts in ways which are really sort of concrete. It helps them to see that maybe they don't know what some words might mean. Even when before they were reading it, they really hadn't realized that that might be sort of an issue. Um, it does help if you can establish sort of a collaborative culture in the course, particularly for resident students. Um, so that they feel that there's a place sort of at the whole class level where you can talk about some of the things that have been brought up in these discussions. It's really productive conversations that can happen in the classroom. And also sort of about their experiences in CREATE so that they can negotiate sort of the ongoing experience there. Now the final thing is you do not have to uh, use the same grading criteria that I propose here. But I do like to push faculty to consider that doing something like this is actually a lot of cognitive effort for students. It takes a lot of time, more so than some of the other activities. But from what students have told me, it's actually very worthwhile for them. Um, they can always argue about whether they want to keep the activities or lose the activities. And I've yet to have a class to argue for losing the activity. But it's important as an instructor that you know that how you choose to reinforce it will affect the amount of effort that students will be able to give to it. So what this means sort of at the level of students uh, and what you can expect to see as an instructor. We have seen that the quality of conversations improve quite a bit. There's differences whether it's undergrad or graduate. Now, from an undergraduate level, I have many students that start off like this. This is what a typical discussion looks like. These are four unsubstantiated claims. None of them are building on any of the others. They just go into the room. They say their piece. They're done. By the end, we start seeing things like this. This is one person makes a claim. The other person extends the claim. The third person begins to offer an alternative perspective that's actually based on coursework. 
And so what we're seeing and what students have reported is that part of it is they just really don't understand what the goals are for collaborative activity. And so when they start to understand some of these things, it actually helps them um, to you know, reframe their activity. So here's an example. This is real students um, discussing their discussion processes, right? And they're trying to decide what is their weakest area based on the criteria. And the student says, well, is it idea building or exploring different perspectives? And then Allison says, well, I think it's actually both. Because we did a good job with this, but if you look at what we did here, you know, we didn't really good, do a good job. So perhaps the next time we discuss, we should go about it this way. And then Carl says, oh yeah, I agree with that. But if we're going to do that, then we need to change the way that we approach the, the reading questions that we're supposed to do before the discussion. And so what ends up happening, going back to the idea that cognition is nested, is that when students realize that there's certain expectations for them for how they have to discuss content in a sophisticated manner in CREATE, one of the most difficult ones is discussing alternative perspectives which requires that they go beyond the reading sometimes. It actually changes the way that A, they approach reading the material, and B, the way that they prepare for discussing that material, which is why it takes up so much time, because they're no longer just reading the content. They're doing all this sort of thought work beforehand. Now, the other really important thing, particularly to Todd and I, is to actually talk to the students. Because we're doing this not because we think that it's cool, which we do, but also because we're really fundamentally trying to meet the needs of students. And beyond the fact that this could have the potential of improving the quality of discourse, it provides opportunities for students to create social connections. This is one of the biggest themes that came out of my online students. And it's kind of a sad thing, but I had a student once tell me in feedback that when they decided that they couldn't be a resident student because of their commitments to family and work, they gave up on the idea of having friends and of creating a peer group. And they had to make peace with the fact that their educational experience was going to be different. <laughs> and he said that because of the CREATE activities, that he actually made long-lasting relationships. These online students who were in different states started making plans to meet each other, uh, you know, like at conferences or like at halfway points. And I had students who during these activities had horrible crises happen and their group stepped in in a way that was above and beyond. And so there's certain things that we're meeting here, certain needs that we're meeting for students that goes beyond just the cognitive. Right? And so, um, you know, that I think is, is one of the important things that we're trying to do here is really try to understand how we can meet sort of the whole needs of the student, not just, you know, are they learning the material that we think that they should learn? But are we preparing these students to understand this material in ways that could be meaningful outside of the classroom. So now, uh, I, I have covered sort of the, the top three things that I wanted to cover, um, but there are definitely other ways which we could go into this discussion, but I'd like to sort of leave it up to the folks who are in the room and the folks who are joining us online. So, um, thank you, Marcella. Really interesting things. As you know, I only have a small list of questions, but <laughs> I, I want to hold mine off for a moment because I know we have some dialogue going on in the online space. So um, Brad or Haley, uh, Brad, would you go first? Oh, Haley will? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Hi. Okay. So the uh, first question online is from uh, Jesse. She's asking, is this somehow, uh, I'm sorry, is this somehow linked to existing psych personality tests to help individuals focus on their strengths and weaknesses during the CREATE process? So it is not currently linked to any um, psych personality tests um, of that nature. Um, we, we made a, a decision in terms of, of what level we wanted to provide feedback to 
Um, and because of the, again, the nested nature, um, you can provide individual feedback or you can provide group level feedback. And there's some research to indicate, and I'm thinking this is Deshaun et al. 2004. Uh, their paper is sort of a, a multi-level analysis of uh, group performance. And um, they did this really interesting study where they had teams do sort of a task, an iterative task. It was sort of a cooperative, a collaborative in nature. And then at each time, they would give them feedback. And they would either give them individual feedback for one set cohort. The others, they would give group feedback. And the third, they would give both individual and group feedback. And what they found was that those that received individual feedback, um, individuals improved significantly in the ways in which they performed the task. But the group did not. If you gave the group feedback, then the group improved significantly in the way in which they did the task, but individuals did not. And if you gave them both group and individual, you got significant improvement nowhere. Right. And so um, it, it makes sense if you think about the fact that we only have so much cognitive uh, energy to provide to improving upon something. And if you understand sort of a self-regulated learning literature, um, it's not just awareness of what is the, the problem or issue, but whether you have the cognitive space to attend to it and know what to do to improve it. So given that what we really wanted to see was an improvement of the ways in which people engage in collective sense making. Um, we prepare them for individual discussion by helping them to reflect on the content individually. But then the other form sort of a feedback and analysis was a gap analysis of where the group is now and where the group needs to be. Is there an optimal number of, sorry, is there an optimal number of students to have in the group? That is the age-long question. Um, so you know that you don't want it to get too big. Four is kind of high. It depends on the task. Um, I prefer to have three students in, in, in the CREATE system just because there's more conversation. But um, because of the unpredictability of, say, world campus courses, many times it's two students. And two students work perfectly fine. Um, so for this particular system, I would say two to three would be the ideal that you would strive for. Thank you. There's a quick request to uh, show the tool again, specifically the help prompts when groups identify their weaknesses. I don't know where that is in your presentation. Otherwise, I Sure. Let me see. And then, Larry, I think we can do some questions in the room. Otherwise, we've got some huh. online. So I could log into the CREATE system and show them that with my group where there's no students. Can I do that on this computer? Uh, yes, we can set up a screen share while you're ask, answering the next question. How about that? OK, sounds like a plan. So while Brad is um, setting that up, um, can I just ask a point of clarification as well? Sure. The, the scaffolding system that helps the students learn how to ask, ask a better question in that engagement, mm -hmm. is that that is at the heart of the engine of this, yes. right? And how does that happen? Is that magic or like what, what's the mechanism that's, that's making that occur? So, so that's a really good question. Um, and can we hold off sure. on that question? Because I think it would be the perfect one for possibilities for future research. Okay, sure. Sure, because sure, sure. we've designed everything in the system to be modifiable such that any faculty, they don't have to use our rubrics. But there are certain things they have to consider. So they could have students reflect or target anything they want. And I can show you that while also speaking to that Terrific. engine. Terrific. So it uh, looks like Brad has you set up. And then we'll go to the room here for the question. Always fun, <laughs> right? OK, so let's go to uh, this is um, mine and Todd's little group. Um, so this is the, the system. Actually, let me go to one that Todd and I, I think, filled out. This is the sign, by the way, of a brave faculty member. I know, okay, right? Like, yeah, let's go do it, you know. What's the word? Yes, we have? filled that one out. Okay. So um, this is Todd and I just sort of playing with the system. And um, up here, as you'll see, um, we're sort of articulating self-regulated learning theory through the ways in which they progress through these tabs. The students don't necessarily need to know that. Um, we're going to be adding some stuff to the plan tab. 
Um, this is where they have their conversation. This is the reflect tab. So the, the six things that we have in there right now are really coming from um, across literature in terms of these being important things that are associated to a uh, team's performance or the quality of decision makings or things of that nature. Some of these are more controversial than others. I could spend an hour talking to you about why I'm not 100% sure about verbal equity, but that might be for another talk. But let's um, give you one that's a lot less controversial would be quality of claims. Yes, this is what the students see. So after they have their discussion, the idea is one of the biggest problems with regulating process is that process isn't a tangible thing, right? And so if you look at sort of theories of what's so difficult, they don't have a shared object of reference with a process. We tried video. That's really hard because people can't skim and go through it. So this is one of the design decisions that we made was text-based because this is basically an archive of what happened, right? So the entire um, team can go through this. As individuals, they would go through and let's say they get to quality of claims and they'd say, huh, why is it important? We put that in there. Um, and then they have to decide on a scale of one to five, right? Where one is members make claims without providing any reasons and support to five, where we're looking for at least two examples. And this is where it gets tricky, by the way. And I've had sort of arguments with some colleagues who are like, this, this, isn't, this isn't valid. How do you know that it's two? I said, I'm not saying that it's two. I'm just saying that after a one-hour conversation, there should be at least two points where people make a claim that is connected to some sort of credible source. That's not too much to add. And we've looked at raw data of teams, and we saw that's actually much higher. So we, this might be on the low end, right? But this should be feasible. If this isn't feasible, more there's a problem. One. Right, more than one, right? Like, if, if you're not having more than one, it's a problem. If you're not having any, you know you're dysfunctional in that area. So, um, but the other really important thing is that what we said as average was, you know, logical claims but their opinion-based rationale, which is really, really common. A lot of our students bring really great anecdotal um, sort of explanations, and the logic is really nicely done. It's not, and so we don't want to say that it, it's not great, but we want to move them towards the direction where they're actually pulling from either the coursework or some credible online type content, right? And so students have to not only discuss these things, um, but they have to provide rationale or evidence from the actual transcript. And the way that I make them think really carefully about this in my course is I say, yeah, you know, I'm going to disagree with you, but if I rate you low and you rate yourself high, I'm going to look at your evidence. And if you can give me really good evidence, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And so they're really thinking about these things very carefully because it really does impact. Um, and so um, the other one that's really interesting, which I just recently added, is affect. Um, this one doesn't show up um, with strategies for how to improve, but just knowing that how you're feeling that day can impact the group. And watching students have discretion, you know, I was really tired today and I just wasn't really with it today. Uh, maybe we should meet actually earlier because it would probably be better for the group if I had a little bit more energy or something like that. So that's really what happens. Now, once individuals assess each of these things, um, so I'll do one more, um, joint idea building, because that's a big one in CSCL. And what students don't realize is that simply agreeing with an idea isn't sufficient. There are strategies for extending an idea, for um, elaborating by giving concrete examples of what somebody else has said, like, oh yeah, I know what you mean, blah, 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 and this also applies to such and such. Those types of communication moves lead to also more sophisticated discourse. So once individuals um, rate themselves, then they see the average of the entire team, and then they have to negotiate collectively what is the team's strength and what is the team's weakness. And Todd and I just, you know, fill this out for the, for the heck of it. But this, going back to your question, which I'll tie now, Larry, 
is depending upon what they pick as the weakness, let's say I think quality of claims is, and I submit that, that's what the system will recommend in terms of what are some strategies that they may want to work on and improve. So now let me show you how that works. And I can do that live. <laughs> All right. So as an admin, this is where um, opportunities for research and future research are, are some interesting stuff here for people who are in psychology or in education. Everything that we've created here is modifiable. And let me go back and show you what that means. That means that each of these reflection items is modifiable. Um, and the instruction that people see in the chat here is modifiable. So you can have them talk about anything and reflect on anything, you know, theoretically. But what that would mean is that um, we have to then, you know, edit the instructions. And this, again, is a prototype. TK over here and his team are doing some really great work now to try and um, streamline the administrative side. Because this was a prototype, we streamlined what students would see. We didn't pay so much attention to what you know, we would see. But now that we want instructors to work on it, we have to try and make sure that it's super easy for instructors to use too. So here is the rubric editor. What that means is that this is what currently is there for students to reflect on. And you can add a new category. And if you add a new category, then what happens is you have to basically explain um, what that, uh, what the description of it is, why it's important, and then you sort of create your own scales. We did that for information synthesis and for knowledge negotiation, but somebody could do that for, let's say, um, writing a paper. What if students were, were, had to evaluate sort of a peer evaluation of a paper and they wanted them to reflect on, say, coherence? Or they wanted to reflect on um, the quality of the research question or things of that nature? You could do that and have people discuss that. It's completely up to you. Um, now, the part that is more difficult is that basically what I did in this system is that I inputted uh, probably 10 years of research on the biggest problems that people have when they're collaborating and strategies that one could use to mitigate those problems into the system already. And the reason why I did that is because I've been working for 10 years to try and help people collaborate better. I worked with Lisa Lenz over there to try and teach um, teaching assistants how to help collaborative teams. But the amount of expertise that that requires is a lot. for Instructors just don't have the time to develop that. So we wanted to put some of that expertise in the system. Because it isn't enough to know that there's a problem and recognize and evaluate the problem if you don't know what to do about it afterwards. And that's what the system can do. So for the, for the guides, that's what we have inputted here. So here we put on like what the biggest problems are and depending on the problem we can get, you know, add, here's some strategies that they can use um, to resolve them. Now, no, no, students cannot get to this. This is just for the faculty. So um, when you add teams right now into the system, you get to decide um, who's in the team, what instructions they use. So if you wanted to run an experiment, you could have different instructions if you wanted to have different control groups. Um, what they reflect on, so they don't all have to reflect on the same things. You could control for different things. You could control for whether instructions are funny. You can, you can start to really um, address some really interesting theoretical arguments that have been made and start seeing how they play out in real conversation. So that's what I think is really interesting about the potential for, for research. So Marcella, I, I love uh, what I'm seeing here. And, and uh, I would guess that we have some questions in the room. Mm -hmm. And I know that we have a few more online. So if it's OK, I'm going to move the yep. mic ar around. And we'll get them to our folks here. One second, Lisa. You can probably put the talk back on now, Brad. You go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, thank you for, for, for the amazing talk, first of all. You know, I really enjoyed it. Um, 
one quick question I had was uh, when you were de developing the system, you know, mm -hmm. what were one of the most basic things you wanted to have in the uh, in the system? Some of the the most basic things that I wanted to have. Yeah. Um. So given. Then what our root concept was, uh, we knew that there had to be a collaborative chat space. It wouldn't work without it. Uh, one of the first decisions we had to decide was um, text-based or video-based. Um, we knew there was trade-offs to that. Um, video provides sort of richer connection and social connection, um, but at the loss of the shared objects of reference because we tested video and it was very difficult for students to be able to pinpoint sort of what was said and when. That was much more um, easy to do with, with the text-based. And so that was one of the first ones is that because the other most important thing that we knew is that we wanted to address the underlying thinking processes of collaboration. So, and this is different than just people say, oh, why don't you just use, you know, Google Chat or Skype. Um, because we weren't interested in providing students with a space to collaborate as much as we were to giving students a space to think about how to collaborate better and what types of things they would need to do to improve. Terrific. Thank you, Marcel. I'm going to go to Lisa and then uh, Brad, if you can get us queued up on the online. Um, to your point about the place where students can learn I forget how you just said that, to do the collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and then you said something earlier about the guides and that faculty could see what you were showing. Mm -hmm. But the students can see the guides that the faculty enable. Correct. And when they see the guide, do they see everything in there or is it tailored to what they've done? What do you mean by tailored to what they've done? Um, like if they didn't do particularly well in a, in a particular area, is the guide just a standard yeah. guide that they see everything? They don't see everything. That's a, that's a good question. In, in the system, the only part of the guide that they would see is the strategies that line up to whatever weakness they have identified. So we're trying to filter the amount of information that they see to basically give them the best advice to try and resolve whatever problem they're having. Um, and, you know, again, at the administrative end, we get to decide what the rules are for if they're weak here, because they say they're like a two, then this is probably the best strategy to sort of give them. So there's a little bit of logic back there with what they see. However, the guides that are in the system, if you want to just see the guides, and I've shared these with TLT, if you go to my website at um, sites.psu.edu, there's um, resources for teachers, and there's four guides there. The system right now only has two areas of, of four that we've argued are sort of important for collaborative teams. So the information synthesis and knowledge negotiation guides are there, and that's the entire guide, everything, which you can just, you know, have. But there's also planning and productivity, which are currently not parts of the system. Um, they, they might be at some point because those are sort of other areas that students have issues with, but from the research that I've done, I see these things more as project management components and information synthesis and knowledge negotiation is more of the communication component of it. Good. Thank you, Marcella. Thanks, Lisa, for that question. Brad, let me go to you with the online group. Sure. The uh, next question is, how can the group feedback improve group performance without also improving individual performance? So um, that's a really good question. Because what happens is that at the level of the group, it's not just about what an individual does, but how they coordinate activity between people. And so if, for example, they decide that, you know, we're not really sharing alternative perspectives, there may be one person that hasn't prepared very well for the discussion, but it's not about really attacking that person. It's about solving that problem. And so they're like, how can we as a group improve this problem. Um, oh, so one of the strategies is that, you know, maybe we could do some research. Each of us can sort of take another area of this, of this um, content that we're reading and go out and see, you know, what other alternative perspectives there might be. So why don't we try coming prepared? So as a team, they're resolving the problems. 
which usually leads to individual change. But I think that the, the big difference there is that when we start assessing individuals, then people start feeling attacked. Or people can start feeling like this is your fault. And so when you frame it at the level of the group and they have to plan concretely how each of them is going to try to modify that, it takes that away from this is your doing. And it's more of a group interaction problem, which it really is. It's, when it comes to level collaboration, it's not one person, but it's the interactions between people that become problematic. Thank you. And, uh, Brad, we have one here in the room. Hey. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the technology underpinning the system, um, what it's built in, how it interacts with other systems, what features you might see adding. That is a Todd question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, if you, in terms of the um, research approaches, is it are you considering using like natural language processing in the system? Let's go back to natural language processing. But first, I think Todd and TK can talk about about the system. And can we pull up Todd? Hi, Todd. Can you hear Hello. me? I can hear you. Yes. Volume up a little bit. Hello from California. Hi, Todd. Hi, Todd. So, so Todd, did you hear the question? Yes, uh, the technological underpinnings. Um, so it's developed primarily with PHP, uh, JavaScript, with some Ajax calls to a MySQL database. Um, so it's all pretty much uh, procedural code. Um, I should say I'm not a programmer. I just I can program, and I'm 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 very nimble at keeping up with what Marcella wants to do. So that was our that was how we worked well together. I could uh, quickly put up some prototype uh, code that um, Marcella could test out. So um, uh, it was definitely a it's uh, definitely a prototype system. Uh, it would definitely have to be reprogrammed to scale up to you know thousands of users instead of a few hundred. But um, so that's the basic. Uh, Technological underpinnings. Okay. Do you, so the PHP and the, do you want to talk about the database? Yeah, the the database is a MySQL database. Um, so it had several different tables with um, the guides, the uh, chat, discussions, uh, any administrative functions, uh, and also the teams and users. So there's um, uh, quite a bit of um, preliminary uh, back-end work that we did probably took a year just to get all that set. Thank you, Todd. And, um, and uh, so to her second question, which yes, I think she was interested uh, about the about use that. of the uh, technology within yes. our learning management system. TK? No, it's a machine oh. learning, right? Oh, machine learning. Okay. Natural language so processing. So this, this project was originally funded by Cyber Learning um, NSF, and it was in collaboration with Carolyn Rose, who does machine learning over at Carnegie Mellon. And so one of the nice things about this is uh, all the database imports in terms of the reports of what students are saying and things of that nature are designed so that they feed very nicely into a machine learning system. Um, and it should play very nicely with an agent-based system as well. Uh, one of the things that we did, uh, Carolyn and I, was because I've developed uh, a reliable way of coding the quality of collaborative interactions uh, that is very systematic and, and methodical. We wanted to see whether we could get a machine learning system to do it automatically. It is very complicated because where many machine learning systems are doing sort of um, utterance by utterance, in order to get the quality, it's sort of a collection of utterances, so you lose a lot of N, right, when you do that. And so um, in, a, in a chapter that her and I just wrote, we were able to get fairly accurate automatic assessment of collaborative processes, but it did have to have a human in the loop at the beginning. So by the end of, of, of the semester, uh, the, it was fairly accurate. That's a really, really important question for a number of factors. One is that people are really terrible at assessing how good they are at something. Um, and so the calibration is important. So there's a lot of still very important questions that need to be answered in the system, and machine learning could play an important role in that. Any other questions, um, uh, Brad? We're, we've probably got room time for one more, I'm guessing. You may have answered this already, uh, but uh, how can individuals uh, gain access to the tool itself? Okay. Um, so 
access to the tool itself will be dependent upon uh, when TLT has finished expanding to the university. Um, there may be other ways to get access to the tool, uh, which you would have to have a conversation with Todd. Um, but, you know, we, we were originally sort of um, trying to develop this so that it would be open source. So that anybody who would have interest in the tool or technology would have access to it. So would, if someone um, today was interested in integrating this into their course or, or, or running it as a prototype, would they reach out to Todd? Would they reach out to you or TK? If they or? want to integrate into a course, we're doing some pilots right now. We already have sort of our, our first round of instructors in which they're trying to integrate it. Um, I'm working with um, TLT faculty as well. Okay. We're going to be doing some faculty development modules to try and support instructors who might be interested in using the technology. The goal will be by next fall. Hopefully, yep. Yeah. By next fall, the goal will be to have the system available to instructors and to have modules that would be there to assist and guide instructors so that they could hopefully easily be able to incorporate the system into their course if they wanted to. So as Marcela just mentioned that we are in the process of looking at the whole, uh, Marcela just mentioned that uh, we are in the process of looking at the whole workflow for the faculty side. How do you start from designing the course and to have this as a, a teaching module and to put it into your course? And we have UX expert to streamline, to make things easy. And we also uh, are working on scaling up the, uh, the machine capacity to, to handle more courses. Um, we're looking at uh, hopefully by summer we can have something ready for the training. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Kathy Jackson here and Marcela, they are working on a, a training program for the faculty to help you understand the whole piece and how to incorporate it into a course. So talk to us. Terrific. Um, with that, I'm, I'm watching. We're right at uh, uh, our time here, 2.30. Um, Marcela and, and TK and Todd, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and sharing with us really what I find is very exciting work. And I'm, I'm only sorry that it wasn't embedded into Facebook this last, oh, I don't know, say, election <laughs> cycle. Yeah, but we no, might have right? used some logic. It would have been very useful. This is, this is marvelous. And really, I, I just think such a, an addition to our uh, pedagogical model. And what I love most about this is, is how we're, we're training students in critical thinking and analysis in these collaborative spaces that moves them forward. Mm -hmm. I, I loved your point about moving away from opinion you know, and that opinion being formed in the community and bumping it up to the evidence. So, uh, so kudos for that to, to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, folks, I'm going to sign off. Thank you to our online group for joining us this afternoon. You've been marvelous. Uh, look forward to seeing you all in the fall. I'm sorry, in the spring. I am going to give you a little um, uh, hint here. In um, We're hoping in early February. We don't have a date nailed down, but we've asked uh, Kyle Bowen and Kyle Peck I have to come up with a clever name around the two Kyles, I don't know, uh, to share with us a, a, a look at the state of um, educational technology, in particular at Penn State. Um, both of these two Kyles uh, think a lot about this. They work a lot in this space. So that'll be a coil conversation uh, we're, we're aiming for early February. So watch for that one. Also, as you, as you always know, if you have ideas or, or thoughts about additional programs like this that you'd like to see, please let us know. We, we love arranging these and we love engaging the community. So thank you for being with us and giving us a good year and a good wrap-up to our year. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you very much for having Signing me. Signing off. Thank you, folks.